God, I feel like I'm having my own personal TED talk or something. Um, <laughs> so welcome back and, um, and I hope you had a good lunch break. Um, just also um, a quick hello for colleagues um, that are joining online. I, I think we're sharing with you also uh, a link for Menti in case you have questions for us. All right, cool. Um, so in order to get us in the right frame of mind, in order for us to also have some kind of common vision of where we are at the moment with the different situation, different contexts, um, and different kind of, you know, enabling or challenging environment that we're operating in. Um, uh, this session is going to look at this session is going to look at three different things. Um, we're going to be looking at the environment surrounding uh, the situation that we're operating in. Uh, we have Catherine joining us from Norwegian Red Cross to talk about displacement and impact of climate change. We're also going to have uh, colleagues from OCHA in New York joining us very, very bright and early for him um, to talk also about the systems and what's coming up. And then we're going to have a question to you also on how you think CCCM can contribute to the different review and process going on related to the coordination structure and humanitarian response to internal displacement in general. And then lastly, as a third component of this session, we're also going to talk about you, like the people that are currently working in CCCM. And we're going to have some key highlights um, from the global learning need assessment that was launched by capacity development colleagues um, to see what are your priorities and what are important to you at this point. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Catherine to join me. And please give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much. I'm just going to figure out how to hold these. Um, the other way. Yeah, here I am. Uh, as Juan said, I come from the other NRC, the Norwegian Red Cross. Uh, we always get mixed up. And if my colleagues from the Danish Red Cross were here today, I'm sure they'd say the same about DRC. Um, I am not a CCCM person by background. In fact, I am not even originally a climate person. I started out in disaster management in DRR. And one of the reasons why I never went in to be a climate person to begin with is the fact that climate change seemed very slow. Back when I started out, it felt very far away. Those impacts were coming years down the line, and of course, we would avoid them. We would avoid them long before the ocean lapped at our feet. But that's not the case, is it? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reviews the evidence on the impacts of climate change every seven to eight years. When their last report came out, they looked at the evidence in total and they said, look, we will have to reach four degrees of global warming before we see a critical impact on the occurrence of extreme weather events. Now our ecosystems, they said, they're a little bit more frail. We will see problems with them already at two degrees warming. But in the intervening years, we are seeing larger extreme weather events. We are seeing more frequent extreme weather events. And we are seeing extreme weather events taking place in areas where they weren't a problem before. And so when the IPCC, the panel, updated their assessment this year, that blinking warning light had moved. And they said, already at two degrees of warming, critical ecosystems will fail and 
we will see massive impacts from the changes in extreme weather events. At the moment, we are at 1.2, and we are seeing the impacts already. I don't think any of us are unfamiliar with the way that extreme weather impacts destroys or damages people's houses and the infrastructure that communities rely on. What's happening with climate change is that the impacts are coming more often and they are being exacerbated by the changes in the environment around us. The picture that you see here is from Mexico. The destruction of the house comes from a storm, but the sea is lapping away from underneath the pillars of the house. The gentleman on the picture tries to put back sand every day. And his struggle is in many ways reflective of what's happening to a lot of communities. They are trying to adapt to changing circumstances. They are trying to make up for the damages and the economic losses, the intangible losses that climate change is inflicting upon them. And they are not managing. They are meeting what we call the limits to adaptation. And that's not just determined by what happens materially. Why is this not changing? Cool. Can somebody move to the next slide for me, please? Here we go. When we have an extreme weather event, a lot can be done to save lives. Some countries like Bangladesh has reduced the number of people dying from extreme weather events immeasurably through early warning, through the provision of clean drinking water, through provision of nutritional additions. However, what we are all now seeing trouble with is preventing the loss and damage that is strangling communities. It's not just the fact that houses are gone and people have to move. It is also the fact that their livelihoods are being taken away. For the people who rely on livestock, the grazing grounds are changing. Some places they are becoming drier and pastoralists have to range further. And in some places they are becoming wetter. People don't dare to invest because they know they will get a loss. We also see that climate change is changing the ecosystems that are central to how communities live. The range of what can be grown where is diminishing and the quality of the produce that they are making is worse. At the same time, you have the impacts of saltifying groundwater and the health impacts that that inflict. And these impacts are not just limited to on land, they are affecting the fisheries as well. And what we see is a steady narrowing of how a community can make a living. Economic losses, nutritional impacts, health impacts. And the question they then ask themselves is, what do we do? On top of this comes certain changes to the environment that maybe wasn't on the radar for many of us. The human body is actually quite frail when it meets high temperatures. And so we see not only loss of life and health during heat waves, but we see loss in income. We see loss in schooling days. We see more and more factors long before it's physically impossible to live somewhere, making it socioeconomically possible to stay. And people realize it. They can see the end. They can see that in 10, 15 years, their home, their community might not be there anymore. The question is, what happens? For those of us who are looking at climate and displacement, we have to start reckoning with the fact that the answer to that question, what do we do, is many fold. And the displacement that is already happening today and which 
is likely to increase in the future, it might look different than what we're used to seeing. In the case of Bulhar, which is in Somalia, what they see is increased seasonal migration, not the seasonal migration that follows the herds, not of pastoralists, but simply of people who are trying to escape the heat in the city. That's where you get your loss of livelihood, you get your loss of schooling days. But it's also worth asking, where are they moving to? And who is already there? Once people start moving individually, independently, but en masse, that will have an effect of the place where they go to as well. What we're also seeing with more frequent storms, with more frequent flooding, with it happening in areas where it didn't happen before, is that that initial evacuation when the event takes place can often turn into protracted, localized displacement. People living in temporary shelters within their own communities, many of them experiencing this multiple times in their lifetime. This exacerbates the socioeconomic differences that were already there, making vulnerable populations even more vulnerable. The climate is also affecting the people who are displaced already for other reasons. The picture you see up here, which maybe a few of you recognize, is from Yemen. It is the destruction of IDP camps after the recent floodings. This isn't the only place that that is happening. Many of you have been to Cox's Bazaar. Many of you may have seen disaster impacts on IDPs in South Sudan, in Nigeria. And again, on top of that comes the things we don't realize because those floods and those storms, they were always there. We can, to a certain extent, anticipate. But one of the most interesting and frightening parts of the new IPCC report to me is a single map that shows the overlap of where today's IDP and refugee camps are and the areas which within 2040 will have more than 100 days of 35 degrees average temperature in the future. And 35 doesn't sound so bad, but once you start getting days upon days of 35, that has a massive impact on the pregnant people, on the elderly, on small children. And if we do not have the health systems in place adjacent to those camp settings, that is a lot of unnecessary suffering and death. So preparedness within camps becomes essential, not just for the hazards that we know are there and that we've seen in the past, but from what might be coming. Most people who are displaced due to climate-related events today or climate-related changes in their environment don't cross borders. They tend to stay within their own countries, many of them going to cities. This trend is expected to increase. And what we will have then is growth in slums, in cities, some of which will bear a lot of similarities to a camp setting in that they may not be covered by local governance structures existing. They may not be covered by disastrous management structures. Housing will be poor. Shelter and wash will be poor. And there may not be the necessary um, capacity for first response there. And those people will often have tried to stay where they are as long as they can. They bring with them vulnerabilities, not just due to having been displaced, but also the economic disadvantages they may have accumulated. In the meantime, some may try to return. The gentleman that you see in this picture was originally displaced from his home due to a cyclone approximately a decade ago. He's from the borderlands close to India in Bangladesh, and he crossed over to India to earn money and to be able to come home and rebuild. He did, and he got to stay one year before a cyclone hit his town. 
This isn't a guy who gives up. He borrowed money to refurbish his house. And a year later, it was hit again. So and this may be cursing in church, talking to CCCM people. But what we also have to look at is who doesn't leave, who stays because they have no choice. And so looking ahead, we have to ask ourselves, how do we work together, governments, humanitarians, and development partners to ensure that all people displaced by climate related factors are protected against harm and have access to basic services. None of us are going to be able to do it alone. So we have to figure out those partnerships fast. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, so we have um, 10 minutes for, for some Q&A time. Um, we have a few people around the room with microphones also, if you have questions, we're also happy to take questions for colleagues that have joined us online as well. Um, anyone want to start us off? Yes, please. Just on the front table. No, no. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I think it has touched a lot and it has reminded us of a lot of things to which instead us to ask and instead me to ask questions. The last comment you mentioned the responsibility of the government and humanitarian partners to to have like a concern on the victims of a climate climatic condition. But uh, my question is. There are certain communities, even from where I'm coming, things like this has been happening all the time, year in, year out. And the government and other partners has been very have the, the concern is there. The government is trying to, to even move this particular community out, out of that location, maybe to resettle them in a different community. But unfortunately, that particular communities will not like to move from where they are. They will tell you that this is my ancestral uh, land where we buried our people. There are all these um, cultural issues are there. So they will not like to leave. And this thing will come and it will happen to them. They will become displaced. After all, they will come back to that particular community again. They have been displaced and come back, displaced and come back. So why do we, uh, why the, the concern over this kind of a community? Because you have already done your own role in trying to even protect them totally from what is happening, but they refuse. And it is happening. Even this year, I believe Redding City has started in, in, my, in, my, in my place. Definitely it will happen. I'm saying this because I'm from the emergency management agency. We have been seeing a lot of a uh, kind of uh, situation like this. Thank you very much. Why the concern for this community? This is the major uh, question. I can take more. Uh, can I go on? Thank you. Yeah, my question is um, the, the marriage, the marriage between uh, CCCM and disaster risk reduction. In the many debates, when you talk about disaster risk reduction, our development partners are saying, no, that's a development work. But then we see that if we don't do it, it creates an emergency. How can we critically think of having a, a marriage that is not going to divorce or will be forced out because of the development the partner saying, no, you're taking away the, the pie that doesn't belong to you? Okay, merci beaucoup. Uh, 
Lors de votre présentation, vous avez parlé de la température maximale de, au delà de 35 degrés. Il y aura des impacts sur les personnes vulnérables, par exemple les femmes enceintes et les enfants. Mais nous vivons dans un pays où presque le, la température minimale qui est de 30 degrés et quelquefois jusqu'à 40-45, qu'allons-nous faire pour ça Parce qu'on ne peut pas les déplacer partout, c'est la même température. Qu'allons-nous faire Merci. Yes, and thank you, sir. I don't know French, so maybe somebody can write down a translation for me while I answer the other question. I'm so sorry. I come from Norway. They only taught me German in school. It's not very useful in this business. So I'm going to start with the gentleman's question about planned retreat. And then I will actually ask somebody else to answer the question about how can we get a good marriage between departments of disaster management and humanitarians. Mr. Ahmad, may I prevail upon you later? Yes, I saw your hand there. I'm glad you brought up the question of planned retreat, which is when whole communities are facilitated or government tries to facilitate them moving away from areas at risk. This is already happening in a lot of places. It's being discussed in even more. And the places where it is happening tend to be the areas that are most at risk of the sea. The learning so far is of course that communities, they have an attachment to their place. Often a lot of people will not be willing to move until the water is at their feet or until there's no trees left. And for many, it's hard to accept what's happening. And I think one of the key issues that we as humanitarians or as government personnel or even development people, I've been in UNDP, please don't stone me. One of the key things that we have to take into account is that what's happening right now is a change that is so big, it's, it's difficult for all of us to comprehend. And because of carbon emissions that have happened in the past, the temperatures are going to continue to change for some time yet. That means that we need to better understand what is happening. And that output from research and analysis needs to be discussed with the communities that are affected. I'm not a scientist, I'm a simple practitioner. And already I see a lot of investment happening in getting that humanitarian science dialogue happening. But we keep forgetting the communities. It's not sexy work, it's not glamorous work. It's not the work that's going to improve your implementation rate, but actually sitting down and having the discussions so that the communities feel they have all the facts and can make an informed decision is key. But in some cases, there are reasons why people don't accept what they're being told. It's a very common feature of risk analysis that if a risk feels too big, if it changes too much about our, what we can assume, we reject it. Look at the pandemic. Every single risk analysis at national and global level was saying it is coming. And yet most countries were not prepared at all. So I think, and, and here I'm getting off the topic of technical solutions and into solutions going to the heart of where we are. Those communities have to be met with compassion. We have to have a compassion and we have to have plans for when the point comes when they will still be wanting to move. And we have to give them the opportunity to do that in a way that feels planned, where they are active participants and where they are not simply going to a new big risk. That's my two cents anyway. Again, I'm, I'm not an expert in that. Working in climate means saying I'm not an expert about quite a lot of things. But there was a question here about how do you make the relationship on DRR work between government and humanitarians? And 
I wanted to ask an actual uh, government official from a department of disaster management in a place where they are doing this to say a few words. Mr. Ahmad, do you have a microphone? Maybe you can present yourself and Thank you, Catherine. This is Ahmadul Hawk representing Bangladesh government, uh, working as director of cyclone preparedness program in my country. Um, very interesting question, marriage between the government and the um, humanitarians. Who are the bride and groom? Simple, old life and new life. Uh, we have to make it. There is two must actors. The impacted person and the government, they has have to be there, the two must actors. But how to marry? This is government duty to make him sustain a new life. And government is doing this. But never a displaced person cannot be in a better position before the, what they lived in the early earlier time. Actually, it's not possible. We are, we are saying in disaster management, they send the framework, build back better. Is it possible? Maybe. Government is trying to make it is as it is. But if you want to make him better life, though it is not possible, and ideologically, if possible, only the humanitarians can do. So best option is prevent. Please do prevent the climate change because we cannot ensure build back better in this placement. Thank you. Yeah, I keep turning this off. I probably shouldn't. Thank you, Mr. Ahmad. And just to give a little bit of context, um, A, the root cause of the climate crisis and the attendant increase in natural, uh, sorry, not natural disasters, extreme weather events, is primarily due to carbon emissions. I don't know what your humanitarian organization is like, but in the Norcross, there was a big resistance to actually acknowledging that we have something to say about that. We're humanitarian, we react. In this case, however, the humanitarian impacts have become so great, we cannot overlook them. More and more organizations, including some of the ones in the room, have signed on to the uh, Climate and Environment Charter for Humanitarian Organizations. That actually commits us to using our humanitarian voice and access to, to raise our voices and to say, stop with the emissions. Secondly, when it comes to people who are displaced due to climate, there are a number of ways of responding to that. One of them is to adjust the national DRR and disaster management system. And again, I'm pointing towards the table next to Mr. Ahmad, we have Anthony, who is disaster displacement cluster coordinator in Bangladesh. Anybody who would like to hear more about how they have adjusted to increasing uh, impacts there can talk to him. I'm sorry, Anthony, I'm selling you out now. Or yeah, or join the session. Um, and then in terms of how we work together practically in Bangladesh, the humanitarians and the government on DRR in camps, there is a session looking into that tomorrow, which is called disaster risk management in camps. I encourage some of you, well, I encourage as many of you as possible, but then I end up with 130 to please join us. We're going to look at how do we actually make it work between national stakeholders and camp stakeholders in managing disaster risk uh, in a camp setting. Then I come to the last question and um, I'm, I'm going to assume that I'm not the only one in the room who, uh, who doesn't speak French. So the question from the gentleman down here was, in many countries, temperatures are already between 30, 35, even 45 degrees. You said an increase in temperatures will be harmful to pregnant women and vulnerable groups. But if the temperatures are everywhere above 35 degrees and rising, what can we do? Last week was the first World Heat Day. And one of my colleagues from IFRC said something that really stuck with me. 
The problem of heat, she said, is a problem of perception. In countries that are already warm, people think, oh, we know how to deal with this. It's not a problem. And in the countries that are traditionally cold, they say, it's too cold. It won't affect us. The heat waves become dangerous when they last over several days, particularly when the temperature is above 30 degrees at night. The real big problem happens when the body has no way of cooling down. So what do we do about heat waves? First of all, heat preparedness has, according to the IPCC, been shown to work when it makes sure that people get the information they need to actually understand the risk. And again, it has to be presented in a way where the community or the household actually understands it. But secondly, you also need to target those vulnerable groups in particular and have facilities ready for them to actually get shade and maybe even to retreat and cool down for a couple of hours. One type of intervention that is becoming increasingly um, normal in, for example, Asia, but which we have also started importing to Europe, are temporary cooling spaces where people can come to sleep. We don't want everybody to have air, conditioner, uh, air conditioning in their rooms because actually that's going to increase the uh, emissions. But we can look at solutions that serve the collective and we can single out the most vulnerable groups for support. I hope that answers the question a little bit. I think we have time for um, just uh, maybe three more. Sorry, we had the pending questions from the last round. So there was a gentleman just behind. Do you still want your questions? It's okay. And then there was another one that was right at the corner there. Um, yes, and I have. And then, um, and I think we're going to have to move on to to the next session. Yes. Okay. Fine. Last two questions, and then I'm sorry. If you're interested, Catherine is available for the rest of uh, the next few days, but also her session is tomorrow morning as well. So we're going to have two more questions, and and then we're going to. And I'll try to keep my answer brief. I'm sorry. I'm a nerd. I enjoy speaking about the subject. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, what's your opinion on considering that obviously we have to try to mitigate uh, global warming generally uh, for those locations that are already vulnerable and where temperatures will likely rise, should we aim more for relocation or for building more resiliently? Thank you. I can answer that one while the microphone goes to the next person. I think the the best person to have an opinion about what to do for those communities is not me. It's that community. But on a very basic level, what we do know is the Paris Agreement is about stopping emissions and adapting more. And in terms of what the international community has promised to the most affected countries, the emitting countries are falling way short of the adaptation financing needed. So I would say that the place where we have the biggest room for improvement right now, right here from an international level is to affect the financing available for countries. The decisions about relocation has to be had at the local level together with the national and local government. There isn't one solution. Was there one more question? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. OK. OK. Um, uh, what interested for me was the last part that the man tried to borrow money to reconstruct or rehabilitate their house. And again, the flood hits and uh, destroyed their house. Um, my question is not for you, maybe for the uh, senior poster uh, people here. Is it not the time that we have to be as a CCM to be involved in preparedness and mitigation plan and having a manual and guideline how to enhance the technical capacity for the community to be prepared and uh, mitigate the risk in such cases, especially in natural disaster? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, 
no, thank you so much for that. And and I think I think you definitely speak to like you know, like my um I think I think my well not pet peeve but the other version of it. Um, no, I think it's something definitely very close to my heart. I think on how we work, a around preparedness. Um, I think. Um, are you going to comment? Because otherwise, I wouldn't be. In okay. Um, and and I and I think as you can see also like how we design the agenda and the retreat for for this retreat. I think we're placing more and more importance around not only working towards solutions, but also at the other side of the problem. So like how we can address it, and work with communities and work with local authorities and local actors to approach a problem before it becomes a problem. Um, I'm going to. Yes, uh, just to give one last comment, um, coming into CCCM from the other side, from the UNDP side, the development side, one challenge that we saw a lot, for example, in the case of Cox's Bazaar was that there was a need for mitigating actions as well as preparedness within the camps, but also within the community surrounding them. And one of our greatest challenges was to establish the linkages between the existing systems and whatever system would function in the camp. So in looking at disaster risk management within camps, we have to look at the full specter. That doesn't mean that every organization should be doing the full specter. And this is really where partnerships come in and seeing who can best contribute to mitigating and preventing and who can best manage to ensure a good preparedness for response. And I'll hand it off there. If anybody wants to hear more about these issues, you can actually read about them, or you can get in touch with me this, uh, this few days. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Catherine. And, and I think she's definitely given us a lot of food for thought. And I think based on her comments around participation of people and communities that are at risk, I think we can say she's definitely an honorary member of our CCCM communities. Um, and and I, I see there are a lot of questions that are, came in online and I know there are more questions, um, but I think we're gonna also be addressing some of these questions in the next part of the session. So please keep them in mind, I think in particularly, uh, questions around how does CCCM, how does CCCM actors and how does CCCM cluster engage and contribute towards a lot of these questions around resilience and preparedness um, and solutions. Um, so for, the, for this next part, um, we have Sebastian joining us online. Um, Sebastian is a senior advisor on internal displacement um, with OCHA in New York. Um, and I'm not even going to try and attempt to pronounce his last name. Um, and maybe I can ask if we can put him on the screen. Um, um, so as some of you may know or are aware of, oh, okay, there you go. There is um, an upcoming independent review of um, humanitarian response to internal displacement. And I'm going to let or not. Um, can we test your microphone, um, Sebastian, your sound? Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you try that again? Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. And I will let you take this away, Sebastian. Terrific. Um, good morning. Thanks so much for, for inviting me um, to this meeting. Um, it's early here in New York, but catching the previous speaker's presentation made it all worthwhile uh, getting up early. Um, and, and, and being German, I also agree with her that it's an utterly useless language. Um, now to the, um, to the topic of my, my presentation, I was, I was asked to speak about the upcoming um, independent review on humanitarian response to internal displacement, but I thought I'd embed this um, in a brief presentation on, on the broader context, which is the Secretary General's action agenda on internal displacement. Um, and it's um, a, a particularly relevant week for that because later this week on Friday, to be precise, 
the Secretary General will finally release his much awaited action agenda. Um, and he will do so at a webcast um, live event that will also involve um, other senior speakers from the UN, member states, including uh, affected ones, civil society, and displaced uh, uh, um, uh, people. Um, now, the release of this action agenda is the preliminary culmination of a process that has been some time in the making. Uh, many of you may be aware that this document was developed in follow-up to the high-level panel report um, on, on, on internal displacement um, that came out in September of last year. Um, and the um, action agenda is basically the Secretary General's response to the high-level panel report and presents the Secretary General's vision on the issue and embeds it in his broader priority agenda um, including his Our Common Agenda report, the Call to Action on Human Rights, Agenda 2030, etc. Now, the SG's action agenda is meant to mobilize stepped up collective action by member states, the United Nations, and other relevant stakeholders to address internal displacement. Um, and wh while the action agenda um, it covers the full spectrum of responses, to displacement from prevention to humanitarian response to advancing solutions. There is a specific focus on solutions in, in, in this agenda. And the key message here is that solutions is not um, only or even primarily a humanitarian endeavor, but is really a multidisciplinary exercise that requires collaborative action by humanitarian actors, development actors, peace actors, disaster risk reduction act actors, climate adaptation actors, et cetera. And indeed the action agenda echoes quite a few of the key messages um, that we heard um, uh, from our, our previous speakers in terms of what is needed to address climate related displacement. Now a draft of the action agenda um, uh, was adopted uh, by the Secretary General's Executive Committee back in December. Um, and was then consulted, this draft was then consulted with member states and other stakeholders in the first few months of this year. And based on these consultations, the document was finalized and is now, as I said, being launched this coming Friday. Um, and for those who have already seen um, the earlier draft that was quite widely circulated, um, the, the, the final version um, it looks actually quite similar, reflecting the fact that um, the, the agenda really uh, got very positive reaction from, from, from almost all member states in these consultations. Now, the action agenda features 31 specific UN commitments. Uh, these commitments are basically um, follow-up actions by UN entities. Um, and the most consequential of these commitments are arguably on the issue of, of solutions. And let me just highlight a few of them. Um, there's first the establishment of um, a time-bound special advisor on solutions to internal displacement, who is meant to be in place for two years. Um, many of you may have heard that Robert Piper was recently appointed to this post and actually assumed his new role last week. Um, and um, uh, uh, Robert, in his new role, will have no operational functions, but will really assume the role of the UN's prime advocate on solutions with three core responsibilities. Um, High-level advocacy, um, second, uh, strengthening linkages with development actors, including IFIs, and third, um, incentivizing collaboration within the UN system around solutions. So the first commitment uh, uh, or action point was the establishment of the special advisor. The second one is the establishment of a steering group on solutions um, that uh, is, is comprising OCHA, IOM, DCO, UNDP, and UNHCR. Um, that steering group um, has already been meeting since January uh, of this year. It will um, operate both at global level and at country level to drive up stepped up action um, and one UN approaches to solutions really with um, at country level with an eye to supporting 
um, uh, resident coordinator led approaches to, to, to solutions. Third, third key commitment I want to highlight here is, is the designation of resident coordinators to serve as the UN's lead on solutions at country level. Um, I, 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 I could say a lot more about this, but leave that to Q&A if anyone is interested. Um, fourth, um, we will open um, a dedicated solutions window in the joint UN SDG fund to ensure um, that there will be um, availability of catalytic funding for um, multi-agency approaches to solutions at country level. And finally, um, there is a time-bound task force of relevant data actors that's already up and running that's meant to, to prepare proposals for more effective use of data for solutions. Now, these are just five um, uh, 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 of 31 commitments. There are many more in there, but um, I thought I'd just highlight them quickly because um, they, they, they are the ones that, that have uh, uh, garnered a, a fair amount of traction here. Um, now, as I said, most of the concrete and actionable commitments in the action agenda are, are on the issue of solutions and are thus are, are therefore addressed to, to development actors, humanitarian actors, peace actors, etc. But a few of them, a few of the action agenda commitments are specifically addressed at humanitarian actors. Um, and chief among them is the commitment to complete by early 2023 an independent review of humanitarian response to internal displacement that is in the process of being commissioned by the IASC. Now that, um, that, that action too has its origins in the report of the high level panel, which had recommended such a review to make um, recommendations to address a number of challenges and shortcomings the panel had identified with respect to humanitarian responses to internal displacement. Among these challenges that the panel identified were um, a lack of clarity and accountability on the roles and responsibilities um, for IDP issues, um, a tendency of international um, coordination systems to um, replace existing national and local systems and services, even where working through them might be possible. Um, uh, uh, deficiencies in the accountability to affected populations and shortfalls in funding. Now, in light of the assessment of the high-level panel and, and the recommendation to carry out the review, the IASC last year decided to follow that recommendation and it embarked on commissioning such a review. And the IASC has since developed um, a set of TORs for for this review, which focus on three areas above all others. Um, first, coordination and programming. So in particular here on the question of, high, how, of how IASC coordination structures and programming pro processes can better meet IDP's needs um, and, and empower and support responders at the front line of delivery. Second one, um, uh, second key focus area is leadership and accountability. Um, and in particular here, the question of how leadership responsibilities and accountabilities within the humanitarian system can be strengthened to ensure timely response to the need of IDPs. And third, um, the issue of resilience and, and, and of laying the groundwork to solutions. And here, the review would uh, look in particular at how the IAC system might ensure better collaboration with other relevant actors, um, including development and climate adaptation actors, etc., with an eye to, and, and governments, of course, with an eye to laying the groundwork for solutions. And in this context, the review would also look at the question of how humanitarian actors in pursuing solutions in, in partnership with others can mitigate any risks and challenges that might arise in this context with respect to um, safeguarding humanitarian principles and ensuring the centrality of, of protection. Now, just to be clear, in looking at solutions, this review will really primarily look at what humanitarian actors can um, achieve in their own right, rather than looking also what development actors and climate adaptation actors, etc., should be doing, not because that wouldn't be important, but 
um, because the IAC um, really wants to focus here on, on humanitarian actors rather than turning this into the mother of all nexus reviews. Um, now to, to repeat the three main lines of inquiry of this review will be coordination, leadership and solutions. And in exploring the three lines of inquiry, um, the review will also look at a number of enabling factors in terms of how they affect the, the effectiveness um, and efficiency of the humanitarian response, in particular funding, data, and access. Um, finally, just to, to conclude, just on next steps, um, there will be a competitive process for selecting the review team, um, NRC, has kindly agreed to manage the tender. That tender will hopefully be put up in the next couple of weeks. Um, that tender also specifies um, some key selection criteria for the review team. Um, it would be a six, seven member size team that would be headed by an experienced and senior humanitarian practitioner or analyst. Um, and um, um, importantly, that review team would need to be very diverse in terms of backgrounds, experiences, gender and geography, which is something IAC members attach a great deal of importance to. Um, uh, uh, while the review team is being selected, we'll also set up a reference group that is meant to um, support and advise the review team along the way and serve as a sounding board. Um, and that reference group is, is, uh, uh, will be included uh, will be including um, a number of, hopefully, a number of humanitarian coordinators, representatives of cluster lead agencies, ICRC, IFRCs, um, uh, NGOs, development actors, and donors. Um, I think I will um, uh, leave it there, maybe just to say that the review team is, of course, expected to carry out a wide range of of um, key informant interviews at multiple levels, not only at um, a, a global and, and country headquarters, but really also at the, at the point of delivery um, and is meant to engage actively um, with IDPs and their host communities in particular. I, I think I'll leave it at that. I probably already went over time, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Sebastian, for that. And, and I think it's often... Um... I feel like for a lot of our field colleagues, it's also a, re a rare opportunity, I think, to hear about and to potentially also like have a chance to contribute to such uh, like broad review for humanitarian responses um, at this like inception stage. Um, and, and I think we're very fortunate um, to hear about that. Um, so I'm gonna open up the floor for 10 minutes for some clarification questions because after this, we're going to have a look at how CCCM is going to contribute to this process and what you would like us, thank you, Der, for joining for that part, as, a, as you're also, I mean, through your agencies, but also us as a, your chance to also do advocacy around where CCCM fits uh, within this whole review, what we would like to see um, so that we can also join forces in, you know, ensuring that those uh, um, advocacy points and, and questions and, and so on are, are addressed to the right people. So are there any questions for Sebastian in the, regarding the process? Just a couple of folk online are saying they've put in some of the messages into the mentee. I know a number of them were for Catherine, but I think some of them are also for Sebastian. So we'll, we'll search through and see if we can find those and pass them to you shortly. Perfect. Anyone on here in this room? Yes, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian, for uh, a very good presentation. I, I really recognize the mention of the solutions part of it, uh, given the, the level of uh, disaster that's happening uh, back where I work in South Sudan, where we receive flooding with the, no rain. And for the first time, the Central Re Relief Emergency Fund 
was able to fund CCCM because we put in a proposal talking about solutions, displacement solutions, that disaster should not be able to displace people if CCCM can secure the site or secure the villages by building bums or building dikes so that should there be displacement, I mean, should there be heavy rains or flooding, people are not displaced. I, I see a point of the advocacy that we made with um, uh, Ocha in New York when they visited South Sudan and say, you've been neglecting CCCM that we do not have a role to play in terms of being a critical enabler to life saving. They would only look at health, they look at wash, they look at uh, uh, shelter as life saving sectors. But for the first time, I, I, I think through you and your colleagues in New York, when they visited South Sudan, this year we received some good funding to ensure that we secure the villages, secure the communities, and they are not affected by, by flooding. So this is not really a question, but just to recognize the advocacy effort we made in the country, but also Ocha in New York to take this on board. Um, I also have another question for you, Sebastian, from the mentee. Um, it's a clarification on whether the section around um, leadership and accountability uh, in, in the scope of the review um, also include like um, AAP, so accountability for affected population as well. Do I get a third question? Yes, before we come back to you, Sebastian. Okay, thank you, Sebastian, for the this presentation, which is excellent. Um, when you were uh, presenting, you talked about uh, the component that you were going to focus on. Uh, it is a coordination, programming, and uh, accountability and the resilience, if I don't uh, miss something. So uh, what about the a humanitarian and nexus and the development nexus um, because it is a, uh, a term that uh, is a, uh, sometimes coming uh, in uh, uh, the mouth of Ocha regularly. Uh, the second question is about um, the advocacy as he said my colleagues about CCCM. Sometimes we are struggling with the OCHA uh, about financing uh, the, the sector. Uh, what's your point of view uh, on CCM? Because sometimes they say it's not life-saving, so we don't need uh, much money, so it is a problem. So what about you? Uh, what's your point of view? Thank you. We'll come back to you, Sebastian. You want me, are there further questions or you want me to, to, to respond uh, now? Yeah, please go ahead, Sebastian. Great. Um, uh, thanks for the comment on, on, on SURF, which um, I, I will be happy to pass on. My colleagues will be delighted. Um, on the... Um, question on um, accountability to affected populations. Um, it is indeed something that we highlight um, across the key focus areas of the review, not only in leadership, but also in coordination and programming in leadership and in solutions, because it is um, uh, uh, so, so, so critically important. So, um, the, the, the fact that it is not a standalone line of, of inquiry doesn't mean um, it is not central to the review. Indeed, it is um, kind of mainstreamed um, throughout the different um, uh, 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 lines of inquiry of, of, of that, that review. Um, on the question on, 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 the, on, on the, the nexus on peace uh, uh, development and humanitarian, Nexus in the review. This is uh, was uh, probably the kind of the most <laughs> difficult one to square the circle in 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 negotiating these TORs in in the IAC. 
and beyond because a lot of um, colleagues felt that um, that humanitarian development collaboration in particular um, in pursuit of solutions was the most important and most needed area um, for review. Um, and so many colleagues felt this should be um, at the center of this review. Others argued that the nexus and the broader development, uh, uh, humanitarian peace, government collaboration around solutions was already the central focus of the high level panel report. Um, it is the central focus of the broader action agenda. And the action agenda is setting up some a, a, a form of new um, architecture for it with the special advisor on solutions, with the steering group, with a number of key action points. And so there was a feeling that the IAC shouldn't repeat what has already been undertaken um, in the context of the high-level panel report and the run-up to the to the action agenda, um, and instead really focus, as the high-level panel had asked for, on what humanitarians can do in their own right. And there were also a number of IAC members who I think rightfully argued that, well, the IAC is really there to look at humanitarian coordination and humanitarian issues, um, and therefore um, uh, it would be ill-placed to mandate or oversee um, a broader nexus review that is also meant to look at, um, at, the, at, at the actions of uh, development actors, of risk reduction actors, of climate adaptation actors, etc. So the IAC review is now meant to look in particular at what humanitarians can do to lay the groundwork on solutions, including in collaboration with others. Now, it's, it's hard to determine a priori really where to draw the line at what it will look at and what it will not look at in terms of collaboration between humanitarian and development actors, but overall it is meant to stay in the humanitarian lane. But again, it's, 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 it's hard to define very clearly when you talk about solutions. Um, what is just humanitarian and what would be, um, a, a, what would be the broader nexus area? So it's something for the review team ultimately to um, to figure out in, in in more detail, but it was a very live debate for 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 quite some time. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Sebastian, um, and I think thank you so much for also getting up early um, to to share this uh, briefing with us. Um, there were a number of questions, I think, during Catherine's presentation as well on CCCM's roles and contributions towards. Uh, not only preparedness, but also solutions. And, and I feel like this is some of the questions that we would like to put to you. Um, we have taken, um, sorry, I, can I have the slide back on, on the, um, sorry, so. Um, so what we've done actually is taken the TOR of the, the review um, the scope of work, um, and we're asking you those questions. Um, in so next slide, please. Um, and this is what you're gonna find on on your table. Um, what we would like to hear from you is um, how do you think we can contribute to the improving of the humanitarian response and whether it, you know, and this also includes like how we as a sector also contributes towards um, discussions around solutions um, as, as well as preparedness, um, as well as like how we can also, how can the system also support communities to make plan 
for what is definitely coming. Um, so there were three, well, sorry, I think I, I made the, I un uncoupled two of the, them. Um, so, and also it's an opportunity for you to ask myself and uh, as well as our cluster lead agencies to advocate on your behalf um, during the process of this review. Um, so what you have on your table, uh, it's a flip chart paper. So we're gonna do some um, group work. Uh, I think online colleagues, uh, we also have, okay, right. Um, so online colleagues, I think our facilitator is also um, asking you if you wanna go into groups and, but we'll also have the same questions available to you as well. What we've done is taken the questions um, from the TORs um, in the scope of work. Uh, there are three sets of questions. Um, and what we would like to spend the next 15 minutes at your desk is to tell us what you would like to see in terms of the system going forward. And if it's different, what you would like us to advocate for uh, on behalf uh, as, a CCC, as a global CCCM cluster. Of course, you will also have the same the opportunity to ask those advocacy points through your own agencies as well. But maybe I feel that collectively we can use this opportunity to get some thoughts from you. Um, I'm gonna give you 15 minutes. Um, we'll ask you to put those uh, points on the post-it notes, put them on your flip chart. If you can number the post-it notes based on the number on the question sheets as well, this will help us greatly. Um, and before we break and leave them on your table before we break for when we break for uh, coffee, um, we'll make sure to put them up and summarize and, and we'll come back to you and, and share so you can also have a look at what others are putting. So we only have one question. Do your list of tasks and asks yeah. for us or where you would like to see CCCM contributes towards discussions around whether how we can um, respond in a co more coordinated, more effective manners and how we can also contribute to longer term solutions for at risk as well as displaced communities and also how we can work with communities to prepare for uh, what, as Catherine say, whether we believe it or not is definitely coming. Um, so I just wanna take this last five minutes to talk a little bit about the people we currently have working in CCCM. Um, as Maddie said this morning, we had around 250 people responded to um, our global learning need assessment. Um, more than half of you, or more than half the people that responded um, work in direct contact um, directly with uh, displaced and host communities. Um, and 37% of the people that responded also said that they've never been, they've never been in a formal CCCM training or capacity building events. Um, at the same time, we had also, so 26% of respondents also said that they're trainers. Um, we also asked them to rank what, what, the, how they rate their knowledge of CCCM. And around half rated their knowledge as six or below. And um, the chart shows also the, um, based on their types of organizations uh, in our surveys um, as to like how they each rank uh, their knowledge of CCCM. And I think what I found really interesting was that what they expect in terms of support from our global team um, is the majority, I think the two parts to the majority. One is looking at how we can help them link the training and capacity building strategy to their national strategy for CCCM. And the other big chunk of the support they would like to see from our global team is all like how to simplify um, the training contents and methodologies for local uh, context. 
And I think this is definitely something that is coming up, I think not just around capacity building um, discussions, uh, but also I think across the board in all of the discussions that you're gonna be hearing and engaging in over the next few days. Uh, we also asked like, what are the kind of technical and thematic areas um, that they would like to see included or have more of? And, and I think we talk about like, you know, site planning, site improvement, durable solutions, disaster risk reduction, climate change, um, and environmental uh, concerns were some of the big top ones. Um, I'm not gonna go into more details because I think Maddie's will also, and the Capacity Development Working Group are um, gonna be sharing some of these. Uh, I also read some of the quotes that were put into the survey as well. Um, there's definitely an ask for like more focus, more trainings, more capacity, um, strengthening and engagement at the field level. Uh, not only in terms of providing support, providing training, but also to take back on like lessons learned, on best practices, that it should also impact the way in which we design and uh, implement things at our global level and what we're pushing and advocating for here. Um, there was definitely like a lot of appreciation for the effort I think carried out by the working group. Um, in doing the survey. And, and I think, I haven't looked at the interviews and, and I think there was definitely a lot of comments on as such a great effort that, you know, that you're asking us about these, um, these things. There was a lot of interest also for people to become CCCM trainers. Um, and I think, so I think if you would like to hear more about the future of capacity development in CCCM as well, Maddie and Jen are hosting a session um, to on the last day in the morning. Um, so, and, and I think we're gonna leave things there, but I would really like also to see how we as a cluster can improve on some of those numbers and how I think we can also recognize more. I think the key things that came out also like informal um, capacity building, mentoring, networking, um, and there was a third one that I have now forgotten. Um, but, but I think this is where we are at the moment. Um, and I think as you go in over the next few days, uh, capacity development, capacity you know, has also always been one of the priority that comes up at our global meetings and global retreats. And I feel like we've been putting more emphasis and more effort in it this last two years actually three years, five years, every year we say it's important and it continues to be because I think we're a sector that, you know, the people are, are our sector. So I think it's a worthy investment for us as, as a cluster. And, and I definitely would like to see how these numbers and percentage will look in a couple of years time. All right, and I think that's, wrap up my sessions. As I mentioned, we will take your uh, flip chart and, and we'll, we'll figure out how to do with them, but we'll make sure that you also get to read each other's um, inputs and comments as well. And I'm gonna hand over to Charlie. Yeah. Thanks, Juan. Wow, so just a quick recap. Climate, I mean, climate change, the whole thing an entire review of the cluster system and the fastest run through a learning needs assessment I've ever seen, you must be exhausted. You must need a break, right? Yeah? Okay, so here's the bad news, and then I'll do the good news. The bad news is we've been so interested in these things, we're running a little bit late. So the break's gonna be 15 minutes instead of 30, but it's still time. The good news is there still is a break. There are three things or two things I need to tell you just before you go to break, actually three. So the first one is, as you leave the room, you might see these QR codes by the doors and you'll see them in the breakout rooms too. If you'd like to give feedback on any session, it's really easy and I guarantee it will take you about 45 seconds. Scan it, type what you wanna say, and just it'll go and we'll collect all the feedback on all the sessions. So feel free to use the QR codes. The second thing is that for our breakout groups, we have some volunteers who are multilingual, so they can help 
if you'd like support in the group. So Amina, where is Amina? Can you stand up or wave or something? This is Amina. Amina speaks French as well as English. And if you would like to, if there are Francophone people in the room who would like to catch Amina in the break and maybe decide which session you would like to go to, then perhaps you could go together. Um, Patricia, donde esta? Okay, Patricia speaks Spanish as well as English. So if you're a Spanish speaker, and I can do this bit, si hablas español, y si quieres encontrar con Patricia, uh, después de esta sesión, puedes organizar para ir a cualquier de unos sesiones después. Okay. I can't do the French bit. I'm sorry. Pardon. Okay. Last thing to tell you. These are the sessions. The wording in capital letters is where they are. Okay. So remember, this is ballroom one and two. So... If you want to learn how to be an incredible communicator in a very hands-on, a very cool session, come back here in 15 minutes. If you want to go to ballroom three and talk about really practical barriers, bottlenecks, and learnings, for including ABA, go there and you go around the outside of this room. If you want to talk about who holds the real power and really experience that and really think about who has the power in terms of localization, go and join Ben and James in Asia upstairs. And if you wanna to go to our brand new session where we close the door and we open the debate and you talk about what you really wanna talk about, go and join Juan, Jennifer and Nick in the Europe room, which is also upstairs. Are there any questions on our breakouts? After the breakouts, please come back here just for five minutes and we'll close the day, give you updates for tomorrow. So for now, go and enjoy your coffee and go to your breakouts at 4 p.m. 4 p.m. for the breakouts.